thanks everybody for joining us. We'll get started in just a few more minutes. People are still coming into the into the waiting room. Appreciate you guys coming out. This is a Mass Wildlife Zoom meeting. How's that right. waiting room looking? We, I, I've got everyone in from the waiting room. I, I, I'm guessing that we're probably going to still have more people filtering in. Um, we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. Excellent. So we'll give it one minute and then we'll, we'll get started. Are all of our guests uh, more or less from Massachusetts or do we have some out-of-staters as well? For the record, I am an out-of-stater. I live in Rhode Island, but I have family and I, I hunt and fish in Massachusetts from time to time. Mass here. All right. So what do you say? We good to go? All right, let's do this. So I wanna welcome everybody uh, to this virtual event with uh, Mass Wildlife. Uh, my name is Chris Petty. I am one of the board members of the New England chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, for those of you guys uh, who may not know, uh, we are the uh, sports people's voice for public lands, waters, and wildlife. Uh, we're involved in a number of different issues, primarily around public land and public waters. And um, we have, uh, this is a regional chapter, and we have uh, state leadership teams in each New England state. It's a national organization. It's actually the fastest growing conservation organization in North America. The chapter is also uh, in Canada as well. Uh, as I said, a New England-centered uh, chapter with state leadership teams in each state. Um, and uh, that gives us the flexibility to engage in a number of local issues, to work with uh, the state's uh, fish and game departments, other conservation organizations, environmental organizations, and sort of um, organize our, our efforts on, on local issues. Uh, we also deal with a lot of national issues. Right now, if you're not familiar, uh, in the House, is the Great American Outdoors Act. And uh, hopefully we're gonna see a vote on that next uh, week. Um, and this is a, a really exciting um, piece of legislation because what it's gonna do is uh, permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which many um, projects that are done here in the state are, are partially funded by. And uh, uh, this, uh, it's, a, it's a great bipartisan um, uh, uh, a bipartisan bill and uh, what we expect is the president will sign it once it's uh, it uh, leaves the house so fingers crossed that happens next week if you want to learn more about that or any uh, issues that we're up involved in you can visit our website at backcountryhunters.org uh, our New England chapters on various social media platforms Facebook uh, Instagram uh, YouTube uh, and we encourage you to to check us out there so a little bit about tonight's format tonight um, I'm going to be handing over to our guests, uh, John Rogosin and Jason Zimmer, both from Mass Wildlife in a few moments. Uh, they are going to give us a little presentation to talk about the, uh, the nature of, of Mass Wildlife and the things that they do um, uh, here in the Commonwealth. Uh, while this is going on, if you have any questions, if something comes up that, um, that is uh, in the presentation, you can, in the chat box, uh, type in a question and either myself or Michael, who's also um, uh, from the chapter, will uh, sort of collate those questions and in the second half of the evening, we'll po uh, pose those questions um, to John and Jason. Um, so um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, and at the end of the evening, we will do a uh, door prize. Uh, we've got two uh, prize pack from Mass Wildlife as well as a one-year Onyx subscription, 
which is a really cool GPS um, um, land ownership type of app um, that you can use on a smartphone or on your uh, computer. So, um, so I'm gonna hand it over to both John and Jason. Both of you, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. And um, we really appreciate uh, the time and, um, and letting, us, letting us know more about Mass Wildlife. Great, well, well thank you. Th thank you very much for, for inviting us here this evening. I mean, I also wanna thank all of the participants that are, that are tuning in and we look forward to, to your questions. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and got some slides here. Um, Hey, John, I've, I've lost your audio. Uh, can, can other folks hear, hear John or is that okay? No, I, yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't hear him either. Okay, let's, uh, can we try backing out a screen share and see if that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yep, good. I think my mic just dropped off. Um, all right, so I don't know if you can sit, can you see my screen or? Yep. You can? Okay, let me just, um, so anyway, so so we're basically about the conservation of all of the Commonwealth's fish and wildlife resources, including um, rare plants and animals, and um, and then fish and wildlife based recreation. And what we focus on is protecting, managing and restoring um, land and habitat. Um, and these are some of our core functions, management, restoration and monitoring of, of wildlife species, um, land protection and management. We, we manage over 220,000 acres, most of that on our WMAs, wildlife management areas throughout the state. Um, Again, we're very engaged in creating opportunity for outdoor recreation, um, hunting, fishing, bird watching, and other activities. Uh, we think we've got probably the best pheasant and trout stocking programs in, in New England. Um, and um, we do a lot of education and outreach. Um, and of course, many of you um, are familiar with our regulatory function if you, have, if you purchase hunting and fishing licenses. Um, we have a fisheries and wildlife board that oversees us and we're part of the department uh, of, of fish and game, which includes the division of marine fisheries. Um, we have offices throughout the state. Um, our headquarters is in Westboro. Um, we have five district offices and five hatcheries. Um, and we organize ourselves into sections that work together to get our work done. Um, wildlife and fisheries. We have a very strong endangered species program. Um, we have a information and education, um, hunter ed and realty, the folks that, that buy land. And um, very importantly, our, our district offices are in the front line of customer service and engaging with people on a local level. And I'll let Jason um, speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so in the districts, we're the, the regional offices that um, do a lot of the on the ground work for our agency, the research and management, the stewardship of all of our um, properties across the state. So not only keeping up with the habitat management, but also improving public access to those properties, um, building new parking areas, identifying new locations that we could possibly acquire to provide access to our existing holdings or to waters of the Commonwealth to provide uh, outdoor recreational opportunities. And then when he mentions customer service, we're the ones that are most often on the front lines interacting with the public, um, whether it's hunters or non-hunters on any sort of habitat or wildlife issues. So working them through those um, 
questions or concerns that they might have attending meetings, doing outreach and education on the local level. So um, in the various regions of the state uh, where the, the personnel that you are most likely to have an interaction with on a daily basis. Um, so who, who we are, I, I would say our staff is increasingly um, diverse you know, we both in terms of their training and their backgrounds. And, um, you know, we obviously have a lot of biologists and natural resource managers, um, but we also have a very strong, we, we have a lot of folks that have training in communications and marketing. Um, we even have a, a, a social scientist on staff um, to help us with human dimensions. Research. Um, and um, we, we have outdoor education specialists, we have foresters, we have folks that are, um, have degrees in business administration. Um, so, so we're increasingly um, diverse and, and it hasn't always been that way. Um, of course, many of our staff are, are avid hunters and, and anglers. Um, and in some cases that's an important part of their job, um, but we also have others that, that don't have that background. Um, I think this diversity really makes us more effective and, and better decision makers. Um, one of our, you know, there's a board meeting maybe a year ago and we, we were having a presentation, I think from one of our marketing staff and one of the board members um, made, a, made a comment, um, you know, we all used to be men in plaid shirts, basically, <laughs> um, both on the board and, and, and our staff. Um, and there's nothing wrong with plaid shirts. I'm, I'm one of those guys and we're gonna continue to have men in plaid shirts, but we, we've certainly become um, more diverse. Um, but what we do share as a staff is, is a passion for the work that we do. Um, and each person has a sort of unique role in that. And I'll introduce myself a little more here. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, my, my background is, is as a research biologist and, um, my family thinks I'm crazy about turtles. Um, um, and, you know, I, I obviously care a lot about the, the, the research and, and the conservation, but what really drives me is, is being up close and, and personal and in the field with, with the wildlife. And I've had the privilege of, of handling thousands of animals, um, reptiles, amphibians, birds, small mammals that I've trapped and captured. And I've spent thousands of hours, literally, um, even all over the world, actually, um, um, observing these animals in, in their habitat. And that's what, what, what motivates me. And I've spent much of my career, the first 50, almost 15 years, working in the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program until about a year and a half ago, I became the deputy director. And I'll turn it over to Jason. Yeah, so... Um... My background really started when I was at a young age. My father was an avid um, hunter and angler and outdoorsman in general. And ever since I can remember or I can walk, I was basically going out and doing those activities. And that really led me to having a passion for the environment, for natural resources, and ultimately to pursuing a career in wildlife conservation. So I, I really through those activities and being immersed in nature, I got, uh, got that interest and began to care about the environment. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I have now a, a, a job or a career that, you know, not many people I don't think can, can say it doesn't feel like work when they go to work and pretty much love, love what I do. I love being involved in the conservation of wildlife habitats and open space for future generations, I think um, one of the most rewarding things that we get to be involved with in this agency is, um, and one of the most important, I think, is land protection. So being actively involved in protecting land for wildlife and for people for future generations is, is really something that I take a lot of pride in. And, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to get my master's degree out in Wyoming um, studying pronghorn and I, I got to experience the, you know, the big pieces of open space, the wilderness, the federal lands, um, BLM lands that, that, um, 
you know, just, I think backcountry hunters and anglers was, was kind of founded on some of those principles. And I know that here in Massachusetts, we, we don't have that, those vast expanses, but we do have, you know, well over 200,000 acres of open space just owned by our agency. And that's there for the public and for wildlife. And um, I'm also heavily involved with our hunter ed program. I've been a coordinator or instructor for a number of years now. I, I enjoy our, our three efforts that John's going to talk about. I'm an archery instructor. So I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different things, but it's one thing I'll mention. It's kind of funny that I'm on here with, with John because in my prior job, I was a environmental consultant and worked on a number of different wildlife issues, but I came into contact with him and he's, he's really the reason why I have a job with this, this agency because he encouraged me to apply for a vacancy um, that I didn't ultimately take that one, but I, I got this opportunity and I've been here ever since. So that's a little bit about me and I'll let John keep going with the presentation. Thanks. Um, so what, I'm just gonna list some of our, our priorities um, that we're focused on right now. Of course, increasing the habitat protection and management work um, is always a priority. Um, R3, the recruitment, retention, reactivation of, of hunters and anglers um, and um, shooting sports participants is a major issue. And we're gonna talk more about these. I, I'm just gonna list them for now. Um, agency relevancy, uh, how we serve and connect with a broader public. I'm gonna explain that a little later. Um, operational excellence, it sounds kind of nerdy, but what that means is we're committed to providing really good customer service. And some of us, um, like an excellent licensing system, outstanding website, um, and, and the back end, which I'm kind of interested in with databases and technology. And that's become, it's become evident how important that is now that we're dealing with the COVID um, situation and teleworking and all of that. Um, and a big issue for us right now is the soundness of our agency finances, frankly, um, in part because we haven't had a license increase uh, in 25 years, um, and in part because of the decline in, in hunting and fishing, which we'll talk more about, which connects to the R3. Um, so obviously each of those topics could be, we could spend the whole evening on, but we're just gonna quickly go through, uh, you know, touch on, on these. Um, so habitat protection, land protection, acquiring land is a major, um, of major importance to us. Um, this is an example of Norcross Hill last fiscal year. It's about a 475 acre um, new wildlife management area um, um, that was acquired. Um, it's a mix of fields and, and, and forests. We're hoping to build more on it. And it's part of a complex of a few thousand acres of other um, other protected land. Um, for this fiscal year, we've already protected about 2,200 acres around the state. Uh, we got a little extension because of COVID-19 and we're hoping to do it. We're, we're probably on track to do another 600 acres that will count for the fiscal year that just ended. Um, and one thing I wanna mention about this is that when we buy land, we're leveraging the sportsmen's and women's dollars um, because um, obviously we have the land stamp when you buy a license and that goes to acquiring land, but actually the majority of the money that we spend on acquiring land comes from other state funds. Um, so when we bring these sources together, we can accomplish a lot more. Jason, did you want to add anything on this? Or... Um, so uh, habitat management, um, again, a really big issue for us. Why do we manage habitat? Um, Frank, the simplest way to say it is because many of the Commonwealth's native plants and animals depend on active management. And you could say why they were doing fine without people for however long. Well, the reality is because of things like invasive species and suppression of wildfires and interference with other natural processes, habitat fragmentation, even sea level rise. I'll mention something that we're doing about that. Um, many of our species need, need active management. Um, and he, you know, that includes a lot of our rare species. Um, in fact, over 40% of them, and this is probably an underestimate because this is tied specifically to prescribed fire. They need these early successional habitats or other types of habitats that require management. Um, 
and as probably many of you are aware, many of our game species um, benefit tremendously also by doing um, management, um, including um, grassland, shrubland, and, and, and young forest work that we do. Uh, in fact, for some of our bigger projects that we were, we've been able to scale up in recent years, there was some skepticism from some of the hunters when they saw what we had done. Um, but at least I, I can think of two specific major projects that we've done where they came back a year or two later and said, this is fantastic, um, whether it's for rough grouse or, 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 or woodcock or, or other species. Um, so again, we do a whole bunch of different kinds of management. This is just an example of throughout these sites that I'm listing here are throughout the state where we've done hundreds of acres of shrubland and, and barrens management. This is showing some a mechanical treatment. Um, we do a lot. We're very proud of our prescribed fire program. Um, Jason is a big player there. Um, I don't know if you want to, Jason, you want to say anything about the prescribed fire? Yeah, so I mean, this is obviously a ton of fun to do lighting, <laughs> lighting stuff on fire, but it is serious business and uh, we have to, our staff have to go through a lot of training um, and follow, you know, very specific burn plans and, and notification procedures before we get into this. But a number of our habitats across the state are fire dependent and whether it's through um, just man suppressing wildfires or different uh, factors that have eliminated fires from those um, ecosystems, the habitat has gotten away from what it really should be. And there's a number of our species of greatest conservation need that rely on these ecosystems. So our program working closely with uh, Mass DCR and uh, other partners and agencies that, that participate in prescribed fire are now able to, to manage, you know, hundreds and if not thousands of acres a year um, through prescribed fire and, and create habitat conditions that a number of these species are now um, benefiting from. So it's, uh, it's, it takes a lot, but it is, it is a big, um, big habitat management tool for our agency. Uh, so this one, I just wanted to show you something totally different. This is an island in Buzzards Bay. Um, but Buzzards Bay is home to about 40% of the roseate terns in Eastern North America. That's a federally listed species. They nest primarily on two islands. Um, and anyway, this, this island was eroding. We did a really big project with the Army Corps. They paid for about 70% of it to build up this island, um, which is obviously vulnerable to, to sea level rise. Um, so coming back to the to the young forest trouble in grassland, our board has endorsed some landscape goals for these habitat types. And as you can see, we've been making very significant progress. Um, if you look from 2001 to 2020, but we have a ways to go. And again, this is another example where we've been getting a fair amount of capital money, other state money that we can then combine with our other sources um, to make our dollars go further and, and, and get more work done. Um, I want to call your attention to the fact that we're, we're proposing that over 70% uh, of our land would be managed as mature forest, because you can see these early successional areas only account for between 20 and 25%. Um, so that's important because we're all concerned about climate change, um, and certainly our administration is, and I don't have time to talk about it, but um, this is a, a, a magazine article, it's on our website, and we've done a carbon budget. And because of the way we manage, we can essentially have our cake and eat it too. We, we can do this really important habitat work for species that wouldn't be on the landscape if we didn't open up the, the canopy, whether it's struggling birds or pollinators, um, but we're actually increasing the amount of carbon that we're storing on our properties every year, just due to the forest growth um, that's happening out there. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some of our research. Um, we have a pretty big program with the, the with UMass co-op unit um, working on bears. It's been going on for many years where we're radio collaring bears. We're going into the bear dens. And this is important in terms of our regulating our hunting season. Um, but it's also important because bears, as many of you know, are moving east in Massachusetts. And we have some phenomenal and fascinating data looking at how bear, radio collar bears are interacting with that urban suburban interface um, that can help us better 
better manage um, um, potential conflict. Um, we do a lot of turtle work. Um, we play a big role coordinating with other states for vulnerable turtle species like the Blanning's turtle. We all work together. The species on the right is a bog turtle, um, only found in the, at a few sites in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. Um, our fisheries program does all sorts of research from large rivers. They're actually repeating a study that was done a, a decade ago, assessing the fish communities, fish community health in our larger rivers and streams. And now they're repeating that so we can track changes over time. We're doing, we have a project going on um, identifying cold water refugia for brook trout if the, if the waters were to warm up. Um, so we've got all kinds of fisheries work. I'll remind you, we take care of plants also. We've got over 250 state listed plants. So we've got folks out looking at those. Um, and, and you all are contributing to our science. For example, when, you, when you're checking a deer, um, we're aging the deer, we're taking the antler beam diameter that helps us get, understand the condition of the deer. And then we also have stat, we have people going out and doing um, deer browse surveys and pellet surveys. And that's how we can understand deer density. Um, and when we tie that with deer condition, we can manage the deer population more effectively. Um, we can set the antlerless deer permit limits and we can address- was, um, Something Chris sent me, there's a meeting tonight. We can address issues like um, forest health as well, where there's high deer density. Um, so now we're gonna um, shift over, we're talking about R3. And, and just so you know what we're talking about here, um, since the late 1980s, in Massachusetts, we've had a 41% decline in fishing license sales and a 54% decline in hunting license sales. And um, we care about that, not just because of sales and revenue, but it's because um, hunting and fishing help connect people uh, with the outdoors. Um, these are wonderful recreational opportunities. Um, they connect people to conservation. Um, and also potentially connect people to um, being able to harvest some of, some of their own food. Um, so this is a major focus of, of the agency. Um, we're working on a five-year R3 plan um, that's going to be coming out soon. And um, in order to be successful, and, and we, we've engaged a little bit with backcountry hunters and anglers, talked a little bit about mentoring and you know we hope to engage with you guys more and all our partners because we can't do this alone it's going to take everyone coming together and working together um, to address this issue um, we're, we're we're looking at everything we do um, our skills programs like hunter ed learn to hunt learn to fish um, and then what we call self-learning resources information that we could have on our websites or that other people have or video you know, how do we get people the information they need and meet them where they are? Um, access and opportunity, and that's everything from, you know, having protected land. It's not just our land, it's, it's local ordinances that might create hindrances. Um, Jason, did you wanna talk about that one at all? Well, I mean, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier. It's just, okay. um, you know, that's, that's one of the big things that we do uh, through our land acquisition program. And, and uh, we've been fortunate in the past couple of years to get some additional capital money to improve access to our lands. Um, sometimes we've ended up with properties that are basically landlocked and we work hard to try and um, acquire pro abutting properties with road frontage where we can provide the public with access to go out and enjoy those properties and hunt fish, bird watch, whatever it is that they wanna do as long as they're getting out um, in nature. And then we have been able to maintain and improve or enlarge a number of our parking areas, both on WMAs, but also um, improving boat ramps and, and car top access points, um, working with the Office of Fishing and Boating Access so that we can, again, continue to provide people with consistent and, um, you know, local access to their, to their outdoor areas. Um, so commu communicating with our customers is very important and we're looking to um, redo our mass fish hunt licensing system and we're looking to streamline regulations wherever we can. Um, 
and only 1% of the population roughly in Massachusetts hunt. Um, so pu public acceptance and understanding of hunting is, is an important element um, of, of our three. Um, then there's this thing called relevancy and, and R3 and relevancy are, are related. And, and if so, what relevancy means is if, if I'm relevant to someone, that means they care about me, basically. So it would be fair to say that if there are fewer people hunting and fishing, the relevancy of mass wildlife is potentially decreasing. Um, and some of the same societal trends that are maybe driving decreasing of hunting and fishing are also mean that people are spending less time outdoors, you know, whether it's the urbanization and more time on screens. Um, so, that, so that's a concern. Um, here's an example of the aging demographic of our, of our, um, of our hunters and anglers, um, you know, which, which is a, a concern. So, so as you, um, if there are less people engaging with these activities or getting outdoors, there's going to be le potentially less support for conservation and less su support for, for, for the work that we do. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's some good news. Like if you look at surveys of public attitudes, some younger folks, um, although they're, they're maybe spending less time outdoors, they still care about the environment and are interested in the outdoors. And um, minorities, you know, when you look at market research for camping are driving growth in, in camping. So there's an opportunity to maybe engage um, some of the same folks in, in, in hunting and fishing and some of the conservation activities just raise awareness about some of the work that we're doing. Um, another piece of good news on the relevancy front is that some states have addressed, um, they've managed to diversify their funding whether it's diversifying for conservation, but also directly diversify the funding for the fish and wildlife agencies. And some great examples are Georgia and Texas. In Georgia, um, a year or two ago, the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Amendment passed. It went to a ballot referendum. It was a bipartisan um, effort. Over 80%, believe it or not, um, of the population supported this. And what it was, was it's taking a piece of the sport, existing sporting goods sales tax. It doesn't raise sales tax. Um, but it takes a piece of that and allocates it to conservation. So we're, we're not, we're, we're civil servants. We're not in the position to advocate for any, any particular funding model. But as I talk about this issue of, we haven't had a license increase in 25 years. What I can tell you is that a lot of states are finding that it's not a viable funding model to just um, depend on hunting license, uh, hunting um, and fishing license sales and the associated excise taxes it's important to diversify um, that funding. And that's part of what this whole relevancy um, effort is. Um, so again, whether it's um, on the hunting and fishing side or, or, or the broader um, public, we have an opportunity to increase awareness um, of folks about um, what the conservation needs are here in the Commonwealth and then what our agency's role is. A lot of people have never heard of us. Um, in fact, like if I, if I give a local vernal, I've done this, you know, a couple of times, if I give a local vernal pool walk in my town um, and, uh, you know, for the local land trust, um, and, and if I ask them, have you, have they heard of mass wildlife, the, the number of people is, is, is very, very low, surprisingly low. I live within the 495 corridor. So even just people aware and, and then um, increasing awareness of the opportunity, recreational opportunities. Then the next step is increasing um, participation um, in, in outdoor activities. Again, that's what R3 is all about, but there are other activities. Um, for example, conservation. here we're showing some volunteers that were helping us construct an artificial breeding pool on one of our wildlife management areas for the Eastern Spadefoot toad, which is a species at risk. Um, and then ultimately by getting people engaged we maintain and increase political and financial um, support. So I think that's um, that's all we had to say <laughs> um, in terms of our formal um, presentation, but we're more than happy to have take questions. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was, that was great, great overview. Um, I guess the, the, um, Simply, you guys do a lot, 
is, is what it sounds like. And uh, so we did, we did have a few questions and I, and I have a few follow-up questions on some of the stuff that you uh, talked about, but uh, let's, um, let's take one of the questions that we had. Um, so um, not all states, uh, this is from one of the people in the audience, not all states have habitat management stamp. Can you comment how long that program has been in place? How effective it, how effective it has been in terms of acquiring and maintaining land. And then I'll tack onto that question too. Um, you wanna walk us through like a typical land acquisition type scenario. Are you competing in the open market? Uh, do landowners come to you looking to um, give their land or, or sell their land at a kind of better price? Do you partner with um, land trusts? That, that sort of thing. Um, I can, I'll answer the first part and then Jason, if you want to take the second part. So, so our land stamp, um, it's, it's used, it's, it's, five, it's five, an added $5 when you purchase a license and, um, it's, um, used exclusively for land protection, not for the, for the management. And it generates, um, on the order of a million dollars, um, a year. So it, it's an important piece, um, but like I said, it depends on the year, but it, it, it's not the majority of our funding. It, it's, it's, usually, it's less than half of the funding that's available, but it's critically important nonetheless. Jason, you want to take the second part? Yeah, so um, a typical land acquisition project, I mean, they can happen in, you know, probably 20 different ways, but we have a land agent in each district. Um, that works closely with the district manager, myself, or whatever district it is, to actively search out properties in areas that, you know, we have areas of the state or areas of each district that we specifically look towards. And that's um, based on a number of factors. Wild, you know, the wildlife habitat that's there, rare species habitat, cold water fisheries, um, large contiguous acreage um, properties where we can have good hunting opportunity. So we're, we're actively looking in certain areas, but we do have um, landowners come to us as well. And those t tend to be like the conservation minded folks who want that property to remain undeveloped. Um, you did mention, uh, do we compete on the open market? Yes. I mean, every time uh, a property that we're after, there's other people after it too. So we we're uh, tied to not paying more than appraised value. So uh, sometimes competitors can take properties away from us that we're, un we're unable to get. But that kind of leads into the third thing you mentioned was partners. And we regularly work with partners, whether it's um, towns, you know, work with a town, work with other conservation organizations, um, and, you know, including like the Sportsman's Land Trust and other groups like that. We do acquire grant funding um, for some of our properties, uh, but it, it, is, it is a big part of what we do and it's, it's complicated sometimes, but we are currently working on something that's, that's pretty um, exciting. It's you know, more creating somewhat of a heat map that we're, we're gonna use to help us focus in where we acquire land. And that's based on um, dozens of different factors from climate change resiliency to rare species habitat, cold water streams, and a number of other factors to try and ensure that we're acquiring the most important properties in the state. And I think our current process, we do a good job. Um, we have a lands committee. So all of our potential acquisitions from each district go to a lands committee, get presented. They, a number of different members vote on it. And then based on the votes across all of the districts, the properties are ranked out one through however many in a given year. And based on the amount of funding we have, you're either above or below the line. And, and that process in and of itself uh, lends us to acquiring really the best properties for, for wildlife conservation and for um, public outdoor recreation. Excellent. Um, I, at, the, at the start of the evening, I mentioned uh, the LWCF. Uh, does LWCF come into play uh, with any of these particular um, properties? Um, and can you talk about, about that? I, I don't think it does. Like, I think it's important for, for the Commonwealth and including like recreational areas and, and land acquisition. Um, but I don't 
believe that any of that funding comes to our for our acquisitions. J Jason, do you know? I don't know if you know. Uh, I don't believe it does, but I'm, yeah. I'm not 100% yeah. certain on that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, J I think, yeah, Jason, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about the um, uh, the uh, prescribed burn activity that you're doing. And there was a couple of questions that came in about volunteering. There was one person who had uh, their red card certification. And then there was other, uh, another question not pertaining directly to um, those uh, habitat management projects, but just in general, uh, volunteer opportunities um, that might be out there for people who are interested in, in uh, supporting mass wildlife with their, with their time. Yeah, so with, the, um, with prescribed fire, I don't believe that we're allowed to have um, volunteers participate in those. We do work regularly with town fire departments and the Department of Conservation and Recreation um, and private contractors who, who are certified. But as far as volunteers go, um, and, and John oversees our whole program, he might be able to, to speak to that, but I don't believe we can have volunteers for that program. But in terms of general volunteers, um, obviously right now with the COVID stuff going on, it's a little bit difficult, but we're always, always um, looking for volunteers to help with projects. I, I get contacted dozens of times every year by anything from high school or, you know, Cub Scout, Boy Scouts, all the way up to um, college graduates looking to get volunteer um, opportunities with us. And we're, we're always um, willing to make, make space for them to help out. And I've, I've regularly get contacted by folks who are either just about to finish up undergraduate degrees and, and looking to get a leg up. And, you know, I, I always tell them it's great to volunteer for your state fish and wildlife agency, um, because then you become a known entity, you know, you, they know your work ethic, your skill set. And uh, whenever I see on resumes that come in for job openings, you know, volunteer for state fish and wildlife agencies, or other conservation organizations, it does provide you with a, a benefit of getting a position in the future. And uh, we actually had a question too that was related to uh, employment uh, uh, within mass wildlife. And uh, uh, John, you were talking about just the diversity of position, the nature of of um, of mass wildlife in terms of while well, there's a lot of people who have uh, biology conservation backgrounds, uh, there seems to be just a um, a wide variety of folks. What are some of the uh, non-traditional uh, routes that people come into the agency? Um, well, a, f a few years back, we were trying to expand our, our um, communications staff in, in the information and education um, department. Um, r right now, to be blunt about it, we're not we're basically not in a position to we're, we're not even backfilling positions that, that we have because um for the most part i mean we might have to make a few exceptions we're just in a really tight situation with not having had a license increase in 25 years during that time period there's been 60 percent inflation so i think we're doing a really good job managing with what what we have but it's become particularly acute in the past few years unfortunately um, but that, that's an example where we had been increasing um, in, the, in that area. We also, a few years ago, hired some, a, a human dimensions um, specialist that has a background in social science research and um, helps us analyze data and, and, and do customer surveys, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I will say, coming back to the prescribed fire, believe it or not, um, <laughs> under very limited circumstances, we do, we do actually we will take volunteers. I mean, they have to meet all of our um, standards and um, we've only done it a couple of times, but we, and we, and they have to sign a waiver. Um, we have a form. Um, so if the person has a lot of experience and, and is serious about it, we, we could connect them to our um, prescribed fire uh, manager, but it's a very limited opportunity, but we have done it. Great. I will get you that contact uh, of that, of that yeah. person. I'm sure she'll be, be um, excited. Thank you. Um, Speaking of uh, the sort of uh, uh, ecological succession, besides the prescribed burns, what other methods are you guys utilizing um, 
to sort of create that successional habitat. I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So, so, so we use a um, variety of mechanical treatments. In fact, often if a site hasn't been managed, you can't use prescribed fire right away. It, it's, it's not safe. You have to re reduce the fuel loads. So um, thinning the canopy or mechanically mowing the understory, and in some cases, um, scour sort of roughing up the soil to create like open openings to create opportunities for grasses and, and flowering plants to grow between the shrubs. Those are, those are some of the techniques um, that are used in addition to prescribed fire. Great. Um, so let me have a few like sort of technical uh, sort of questions or kind of more specific questions. Um, someone asked if they encounter uh, invasive, invasive species on uh, wildlife management areas, uh, who can they contact to, to let people know about that? I mean, I, I would say probably the, the easiest contact is to just go right to your, your local district office, give them a call, report it, tell them the location. They're ultimately probably going to be the ones that are most familiar with that piece of property and can explain where, um, can understand the location you're explaining to them. Um, and then from that point, they can take it and report it up um, to Westboro personnel and then determine the, the proper treatment for that, that invasive. Great, thank you. Uh, another sort of specific question, uh, would a person need a fishing license if they're taking their 11 year old, say 11, 10 year old, 11 year old uh, child or grandchild out to fish for the first time? Yeah, so we, we get that question quite a bit and it's, uh, it gets a little bit tricky, but essentially, um, if the the child is able to cast and retrieve the, the rod on their own, then as long as you're just there with them, um, you know, you can take a fish off the hook or bait the hook for them. But as long as they're casting and, and doing all of the actual fishing, um, it's, it's not a problem. But if you're going to cast the rod for them and actually participate in fishing or reel it in or anything like that, then... Um, you do actually need a fishing license. Uh, I guess it's a good time to ask this question. How, what is the agencies or how, what is the intersection between the agencies, uh, uh, the agencies regulations, uh, rules and regulations and law enforcement? Um, how does that work out uh, between uh, the environmental police and mass wildlife? So we're the agency for inland Fish and Wildlife, we're the agency that sets um, the regulations. Our board actually has the authority to, to set the regulations. We just make recommendations to them. Uh, we have no enforcement um, capabilities um, aside from perhaps dealing with MISA, but the, um, the regulations we set and the environmental police are the ones that enforce those regulations. And whenever um, we're having a board meeting, typically there is a uh, law enforcement person present at those meetings. Um, we consult with them typically on any significant regulatory changes we're going to make so that they're aware of them and they can provide input on enforceability and things like that. And we do have a, a good relationship. I can speak for, for my district. I've always had a, a good working relationship with all the officers um, uh, in the district and, and are able to interact with them so that you know, they understand where we're coming from on regulations and vice versa so that um, we can give the right type of advice or input when questions come in. But whenever there's any sort of real technical questions on the regulations, I always just advise people to call the environmental police, um, you know, the, the radio room dispatch number that's right in our abstracts and uh, ask to be contacted by an officer because ultimately when you're out in the field, they're, the, they're going to be the ones that that are enforcing anything and interacting with you on that on that regard. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Mass Wildlife uh, interacts between other agencies, other state agencies like uh, I don't know DCR um, or some of the federal agencies in terms of uh, opportunities for fishing, hunting? Um, 
and access all those things. How, do, how does that work? And, and what are the con uh, conversations like? I, I can talk a little bit about the US, US Fish and Wildlife Service um, because recently they've been going through a process to um, increase hunting access on some of their um, national wildlife refuges in Massachusetts. It just went out to public comment. You guys might be aware of it. Um, and, and we were engaged with them behind the scenes, like our, our assistant director for wildlife, Mike Uginin, um, met with them a few times. I, I, I attended a, a meeting um, and, and we, we gave them some, some, some input and, and tried to work with them. Because what, you know, what we would ideally like to see is the, the rules on, on properties like that to match the, the state regulations as closely as possible. Um, if you see in terms of um, hunting implements and seasons, it, it makes it less confusing. And, and I will say that they've, they might not have gone that far, but they've made significant progress. We were, we were happy with the direction that they're, they're going. Um, we've also worked with DCR. DCR has a lot of properties that are open um, to hunting. Um, we've worked with them and we're continuing to work with them to look at opportunities to, to increase that. Uh, Jason, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll touch on a few of those things. I mean, with the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, we've been um, engaged with them for a long time on their refuges that fall within Massachusetts. And they've gone through a process. I think it's, it feels like over the past 10 years of creating comprehensive conservation plans for all of the refuges. And we're on those planning teams and involved and have input on particularly um, management and hunting and fishing access. So we've been working to, to improve that access. And as John said, we, we ultimately would like it to be consistent across state and federal boundaries as much as possible. Uh, we have worked with DCR, both on the district level and across the, the state on trying to um, open up some of the properties that they have that are currently closed, particularly where we have uh, concerns about deer population um, deer overpopulation and impacts on the habitat. And I think we've seen some progress there over the past um, five or so years. And then uh, on the local level with municipalities, David Stanbrook, our deer biologist, uh, works um, very well. And on the districts, we work quite well with the towns to try and improve access, hunting access on town conservation lands in particular. Um, and in Eastern Massachusetts, it's, it's particularly an issue because access is really the number one thing that, that hampers our ability to be able to manage the deer population at appropriate levels to protect the habitat for all the other species that live there. So we work, um, work hard at, at giving presentations, educating communities uh, about the, the benefits of deer management. And um, we've seen progress there, particularly inside like the 495 belt over the past um, five or so years as well. Uh, there was a, another question that came in on the uh, funding sources. And we talked a little bit about fishing licenses. We talked a little bit, well, actually not specifically, but um, uh, talked about sort of the federal funds that come in from um, the excise tax on, on uh, fishing, hunting uh, gear. One of the things that we hear a lot in the fishing and hunting community, particularly surrounding wildlife management areas and, and, and things of that nature, is that like this community pays for that. Uh, is that an accurate uh, statement? And, um, uh, and then there was another question related to land acquisition that also came in later um, and whether or not there was any sort of mechanisms in terms of donations or um, funds that allow uh, mass wildlife to be comp more competitive and and sort of play above the assessed value of these properties. Sorry, I kind of well, so squeeze the, uh, some things together. Uh, uh, on the first part of that, um, I would say this community plays an absolutely critical role in funding that work. Um, the, the the habitat management, the land protection, um, the science underpinning that. Um, but as I tried to talk about in, during the, the presentation, the, the, the full funding picture is more complicated. It's more complex than that um, because there's actually significant other sources of funding 
um, that helped when we're acquiring our WMAs, we're, we're using a combination of sources, including um, capital funding that's provided that's everyone's tax dollars basically. Um, and the same is true to an certain extent on the habitat work. Um, but undoubtedly our agency um, depends on, on, on those excise taxes and, and on, on hunting and fishing license sales. Um, the second part, I'm sorry, it was, I, I didn't get the, oh, the second part. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say you, you talked about donations or, or other funding sources, and it, that certainly does uh, occur. Um, we are limited in paying appraised value for a property, but if we work with a partner conservation organization that kicks in more money, as long as our agency is not paying above appraised value for the property, um, that is something that can, and I believe has happened in the past. So, um, it, it's in circumstances like that where um, partnerships are, are critical to our land acquisition program. Okay, good. Uh, another sort of pretty straightforward question. Uh, this one, when will hunter ed classes resume? Yeah, I was happy to see that question because we've made progress. And, and in fact, Jason, was an instructor, I think last weekend or the weekend before. Um, so, so what we have done is um, we, we've, we always had as an option, a blended model, meaning that you could take part of the course online through self-study, and then you would take part of it in person. It used to be that the part in person was a day and a half. Um, so now what we've done is we've enhanced the um, online piece and we have, um, added a Zoom component. So there's a self-study piece. There's a Zoom component because um, in Massachusetts, there's a statutory requirement for 12 hours of instruction. Um, so so we've got, we have that in place. And then we just piloted this um, um, where we have a field day. Um, it's, it's actually a half a day um, or a little less than that um, where there's social distancing, people are wearing masks, it's completely outside. The students go in small groups um, to, the, to the learning stations. There's no sharing of equipment. Um, so it can be done safely. And then they take the exam at the end, they put in a box. Um, so, so we've only just piloted this and we've only um, offered it to people whose classes got canceled. There were 700 students or so um, that, that were signed up for a class when the health crisis began and got canceled. So, so anyway, so the good news is we're, we've already gotten 60 students through that. Over 200 started the online piece and we're hoping to open that up um, to more folks um, come August. Great, thank you. Well, we're, right, we're at nine o'clock now and I wanna be um, uh, 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 you know, conscious of everybody's evening here. I want to thank you both for, for your time and your willingness to answer these questions. Um, we do have our door prizes, and I just randomly uh, pulled the uh, two names off of our active list. Um, so I want to congratulate uh, Caitlin Ferris for uh, winning the uh, Mass Wildlife Prize Pack, and we'll, we'll get your contact information uh, for that. And Marcia White, uh, Marcia, you have won the uh, one year Onyx subscription. Onyx is a uh, app that allows you to um, look at where you are, landowner information. So when you're on a wildlife management property, you'll, you'll know where the borders are. My last question to, to uh, John and Jason before we wrap the night, I was very curious to hear what your favorite wildlife management area is and why? I'll go first. My okay, go is, uh, okay. mine is the um, Burridge Pond wildlife management area. And that's, um, that's partially because of my job, but also because I love the property. It's, it's a, it's a, over 2,000 acres in Hanson and Halifax. It's you know 20 minutes from my house, and um, it was once the largest cranberry bog in in all of Massachusetts. So there's about 300 acres in the main portion of the par property of uh, former cranberry bog that we've 
worked um, over the past 10 years to restore into emergent wetland habitat for wildlife. And we've uh, done that with a North American Wetlands Conservation Act grant um, that also saw Ducks Unlimited, Wildlands Trust, uh, Sweetwater Trust, a number of other agencies as partners. Um, but just the, the properties, it's great for public access, uh, hunting, um, fishing, all forms of outdoor recreation. It's really scenic. And uh, it, it's probably our one of our top two visited properties in my entire district. And that, that, there's a reason for it. It's really a beautiful property. So, yeah. Uh, so Bar I've spent a lot of time at Bard's Pond and that's a good one. Um, I, I also um, spent a fair amount of time at Montague and that's a great property. I, I would say um, the Francis Crane properties down in Jason's district um, in, in part because Earlier in my career, there was this challenge that we saw to massively expand the grassland there. Um, it, like, and a lot of people thought we'd never be able to pull it off. It was a very expensive project. And um, to have had a, hand, a little bit of a hand in that and to see it actually get done. And then we've done some other really phenomenal large scale work, um, thinning the canopy and the barrens around that grassland. So I've spent a lot of time there and it's been great to see that, that dream sort of come to fruition. And then I had never been over to the, it's a fascinating property because it's an outwash plain, it's all flat. That's why there's the grassland there. But then there's this moraine, um, which has these, all of a sudden, these these like really big hills, you can see all the way to the, to the Cape Cod Bay. And, you know, for I, I never wandered over there until a year or two ago. And I saw a whole other side to the property. Um, so that's a great one to uh, to check out. So clearly I have the, the nicest district in the city. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> Although I, I do like the Ashfield Holly WMA too out in the western part of the state near uh near Todd's house is on the on the Zoom. So great. Well thank you again and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. Um if you want to connect with Mass Wildlife as uh, John Jason uh, mentioned their website is uh, very robust and you can connect with them also on social media and same with us uh, uh, backcountryhunters.org uh, our Instagram account uh, and uh, our Facebook group um, and we invite you um, to, to follow us there. Thank you again uh, John and Jason for your time and, and uh, we hope you have a uh, great rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Th All right. Thanks. Thanks for having us. It was great. Thank you. Good night, everybody.